millions of people not only have lost income in the last four weeks, but a substantial percentage of those people also were worried that they're going to lose income in the next four weeks still. And that burden has fallen disproportionately on people of color, on younger people, and on poorer people. This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back. I'm here with Bryce Ward for the May edition of Incentives and Instincts. Bryce, how are you doing today? I'm good. It's May. This is the best time of year in Missoula. It is indeed. You know, we've talked a lot about the pandemic in this series and the various economic policies rolled out to help us get through it. One aspect of those policies we haven't talked much about is consumer protection. At the time when many consumers can't make their debt payments, we thought it important to talk about this with another expert. Craig Cowie is Associate Professor of Law and Director of the Blewett Consumer Law and Protection Program at the University of Montana's Blewett School of Law. His scholarship and teaching focuses on consumer protection, and he brings nearly 20 years of litigation experience to the table. Craig. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So I guess the obvious place to start is like, what is consumer protection? Why is it important? Yeah, I laugh just because that's a, it's a much harder question than you would think. But the way I like to talk about it, especially with audiences who aren't lawyers and so forth, is consumer law at its heart is about what role the government's going to play in transactions between consumers and vendors. Mm -hmm. And that can be through the courts, through statutes, or common law, or just ideas of fairness, right? We have a long history in our culture and in other, going all the way back to the Code of Hammurabi, right? And uh, they had a usury cap, predatory lending. Could not, you see that in Sharia law, you see that in Judeo-Christian law as well. And if you look back at the colonies, they all had usury caps in single digits at the founding of the country. So there's a long history of protecting people in certain circumstances, but that's in tension with this sort of more caveat emptor, let the buyer beware attitude that's become prevalent in our country, at least over the last couple of hundred years. So within that, we have this tradition. Are there, I mean, let's fast forward to where we are today. Have Th things happened in our history that have sort of given this concept more salience or made it sort of fall off the radar screen? Like, where, where are we at today with the state of protection for consumers? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Things, things have been a little rough over the last year. You know, we started to see, actually in the late 1800s, a move towards, in, in particular, like food safety, Mm -hmm. And then post depression, we saw a movement about anti, you know, anti monopolistic. Uh, we, we, the Federal Trade Commission was developed. We started looking at monopolies and trying to balance out asymmetries in information and power between consumers and vendors. That has flowed into drugs, and then really there was a, a real sea change. I think in the '60s and the '70s, a lot of people remember Ralph Nader and Unsafe at Any Speed. That really pushed a lot of people to consider consumer issues. So then we saw a, a development of a whole range of statutes designed specifically uh, to address concern, concerns. So concerns about information, so requiring disclosures, concerns about safety, making sure that products are safe. And then this sort of went, and people mostly thought about that in like a product, in like a concrete, like a toaster. Mm -hmm. You don't want your toaster to explode. Although mine did when I was a kid. <laughs> Literally burst into flames while I was making toast one day. And I was like, wow. And that's something we could handle. But then, you know, the subprime crisis happened. And that really shifted a lot of the focus to consumer financial products and services, sure. something more abstract. All of a sudden, you know, as Elizabeth Warren famously said, you know, we have a law that protects you from a toaster that explodes, but not when your mortgage explodes. Mm -hmm. And so after the 2008 crisis, Congress passed uh, the Dodd-Frank 
Act, which created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, basically took seven agency powers from seven agencies, one of which the Office of Thrift Supervision was then shut down, and consolidated the consumer protection aspect of all of those agencies into the CFPB so that there would be one agency that would be on the lookout for things like these predatory mortgage practices that it turns out led to 2008. And that's where we are now, is we've been dealing with that. So there's, a, there's an increased focus, but consumer protection has gone, you know, all covers all sorts of yeah. transactions. Um, one example I'd love to give is, and my students hate it when I use this case because it's an old English case and it's very hard to read for like a modern American, but it's called Carbolic Smokeball. And it was during the 1890 pandemic that killed more than a million people worldwide. This company had developed a thing they called the Carbolic Smoke Ball. I have no idea what's in there. I'm sure nothing good. Sounds uh, <laughs> really interesting. <laughs> and, and they took an ad out in the paper offering, you know, at the time, what was a lot of money, if you use the product as instructed and still got the flu, the flu being, of course, the pandemic that's raging at the time. So this was a really great example for people about how none of these issues are new. Like there's been this, there what they were doing is they were preying on the fears of people. And that idea of a predatory product mm. or a predatory marketplace is something that that's why even if you go back to those old usury caps, that sort of overarching idea is one that we see develop in a really interesting way. So that the idea is like, what kind of market do we want to have? Do we want to have a market where people are free to make informed choices or do we want more of a caveat emptor market where it's just you go into the market and you are responsible for what happens to you? And it's sort of a positive liberty versus a negative liberty mm -hmm. kind of approach. And over time, we've sort of, there's been a push and pull as, you know, political ideology, you know, waxes and wanes as to where it's going to focus. But recently, we had a big push because of consumer issues related to financial products. And that's where we see a lot of action now, although there's still plenty of issues with like data privacy, products liability for all sorts of things, and even things like bankruptcy and insurance, you know, so it's a really wide area. So Br Bryce, l let me get your take, like as an economist, how do you think about where this type of uh, regulatory regime or legal doctrine kind of fits into the operation of free markets. So I'm trying to distill down some of what Craig has laid out, and I think he hit, I think, several of the key points. So the first thing, there's just an informational component, okay, right? Which is, if, in a caveat emptor world, like, I still need information, right? I still need to understand what I'm getting. Mm -hmm. And... Obviously, in a world which information is not always abundant and available, like somebody kind of has to step in and and say, well, look, we're going to have to provide you with information. Now, all of us click a bunch of stuff that's technically disclosure information, uh, like all the time, and we don't ever read it. So, you know, but somebody has to provide it, and it's there for somebody sure. to go and deal with, right? So so first is just, you know, look, you can't really have a market without information, right? So that's the first thing that, you know, even... Even if you want to go full, just, oh, whatever, let the market go, like, you have to have information, you have to have informed choice, otherwise I think you're not in a true free market. The second part, I think, that was lurking through Craig's discussion there is, I guess, you know, I guess we can do safety as well, right? Which is, somebody's got to be actually quantifying the risk. We have to translate sure. that the risk into information, right? So that's basically kind of saying, well, look, I don't want my toaster to explode because if only one in a million toasters explode, I I didn't realize I was buying a lottery ticket when I was buying a toaster, right? Mm -hmm. And so you know I'll, so that's the second wave of consumer protection is, well, let's make it you know there's always a lottery because really low probability events are hard they to happen. you know yeah. to deal with, but like in a general world we kind of want you know so the second wave of consumer protection is kind of well let's let's make it so that when I buy something that uncertainty about the lottery is kind of taken away, right? The government has tested this and we have some sense of it ex exists within certain stand standards and I can probably take that little 
uh, mental burden out. And uh, I no longer have to sit there with my kids and be like, that toaster might explode. Uh, so, you know, you got to be extra careful or whatever it is, right? So, and then the last wave is the predation wave, right? So, you know, what do we right. do about predators, right? You know, people who basically want to take advantage of gaps in information or gaps in regulatory structures. You know, and this is, you know, I, I think I maybe referred to this on the podcast before. I call it the jerk tax, mm -hmm. right? You know, so a lot of regulation that we deal with in society is basically because somebody wants to take advantage of you and, you know, or not just you, they want to take advantage of a mass of us. And so the question becomes, well, how do we protect people from that predator? And, you know, and that's where, you know, obviously the law is supposed to, but, you know, if I, you know, it's the Superman three, uh, you know, thing, if I steal pennies from you, but I steal it from everybody, I can get really rich. Right. Right. Um, and so then you have to kind of, you know, and this is the gray area that we kind of live in, in terms of, you know, the regulatory framework, which is how much effort am I going to put on you? Because again, these are also effort taxes, right? So this is, this is why regulation, a lot of times, you know, when people are screaming about you know, the state being invasive or whatever it is, because it's effort for me mm -hmm. and I'm not a jerk. I'm not trying to take advantage of you, but the regulation hits me too. Right. Right. And so, the, you know, the hard part is, is that there's the effort of, uh, you know, the person who has to comply with the regulations. And then there's the effort on the consumer part in terms of, well, if there's no regulation here, then I have to be worried about this or I may get taken advantage of. And, you know, the state's trying to balance some of these effort taxes that all exists because some guy over there is really a jerk, right? If we all just be nice to each other and trust each other, yeah, we don't need any. We don't, stuff. you know, the yeah. state doesn't have to be involved. But you know, and that's kind of where we end up with in, in economics is trying to say, well, what do we owe each other, and how do we try and, you know, as lightly as possible, as efficiently as possible, and as equitably as possible, try and deal with some of these failures that exist because, you know, people will take advantage of whatever power they can or whatever a little, you know opportunity that exists, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not they should from a, you know, kind of a, a moral philosophy standpoint or whatever it is. Sure. That makes sense. So, Craig, you mentioned subprime uh, disaster, if you will, and then just sort of the rise of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau as a, as a mechanism for dealing with some of this predatory lending out there. Like, fast forward to today and the unique exposures consumers have under the pandemic. Sure. So the pandemic has had a, really an unimaginable impact across the country. So there was a survey, large nationwide survey conducted during the middle of the pandemic, still ongoing by the, Fed, the Federal Reserve Board, that showed that more than 50 percent of households had suffered loss of income since the beginning of, this is hundreds of millions of people, or a hundred yeah. million you know, plus people, yeah. had lost income as part of the pandemic. Now, things are better now, but I just looked at the most recent data before I came over here, and it's still quite bad. It's still, millions of people not only have lost income in the last four weeks, but a substantial percentage of those people also were worried that they're gonna lose income in the next four weeks still. And that burden has fallen disproportionately on people of color, on younger people, and on poorer people, mm -hmm. people with lower incomes. Right now, uh, the estimates are that 2.1 million households are delinquent in their mortgages. And another 8.8 .8 million renters, so families renting their homes, are behind on the rent and mm -hmm. might be subject to eviction or foreclosures. That's almost, that's over 11 million people total, or 11 million families total. As soon as the federal government lifts the restrictions on foreclosing and evicting, we're gonna look at a tsunami of household insecurity. And people are already struggling, they're, they're as I like to say, they're, they're sort of pay, you know, robbing from Peter to pay Paul. So like they're having to make decisions about, do I, do I pay my rent or can I feed my children? And there are still, even though things are getting better for many, there are still millions of people in those situations. And as I said, they tend to be disproportionately people of color. The same groups who, by the way, also disproportionately affected health-wise, more likely to get COVID, more subject to COVID because of the types of jobs that they had, 
less able to telework when things happened. So we've got a brewing storm. So that could be every bit as bad as 2008, just waiting to happen. And the government has actually taken a lot of pretty dramatic steps, Mm -hmm. uh, the CARES Act to start and subsequent acts since, that really have had, by all available evidence, a measure have really mitigated the harm that we could have been looking at. But we still have, you know, this summer going into next fall, we could be looking at, you know, a serious crisis across the country. And so this, this might be outside of the, the realm of, of your expect, expertise, Craig. But, you know, as you're, as you're saying that, we're, we're, we're living in one of the first states to decide that we're not going to continue with these $300 unemployment benefits. And so and you hear uh, you hear employers saying we can't find enough people. People are you know, too accustomed to being on the dole that they don't want to come back to work. Are, you, are we kind of talking about two different populations? Is this the talking points on either side? Like how do we kind of understand? I mean, the, the potential crisis that you lay out there makes a, a ton of sense intuitively. How do you kind of reconcile those two talking points that you see out there? So caveat, right? Not my area of expertise, not too sure of all of the data, but I will note what President Biden said is true. You know, part of being on unemployment and receiving assistance is not turning down available jobs. So I wonder at the evidentiary basis for claims about that. Sure. Also, when I when you looked at the jobs report, which was disappointing, in certain respects, where it wasn't was with the loss, the, the un, I should say, the things that were disappointed were like in education and some other areas where we weren't seeing hires that we thought we were going to get. They weren't in restaurants, which actually are hiring and were bringing in jobs. So again, I'm not sure. I, I think this is a really complicated yeah. question. And I don't think that a lot of the surface, uh, you know, punditry points are really rooted in the data. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, that's what I look for when I see this is I try to find out exactly, because it is a big, you know, it's going to have an impact that cuts a lot of different ways for a lot of different groups. That's just the reality of, you know, we don't live in a clean cut. Yeah. It's a huge (laughs) huge country with a ton of people and a ton of different dynamics. You describe it well and being complex. I'm sure you've thought about this, Bryce. Yeah, so you know, I actually do own all of these things. So let me give you the short <laughs> version that I've given to a number of reporters. So, okay, so first, uh, you know, so at the aggregate level, like all, the federal government stepped in, right? Income is up enormously. Mm-hmm. Montana personal income, uh, in spite of the pandemic, was up seven percent um, in twenty twenty over twenty nineteen, and you know that income did have real effects. So the Urban Institute did a study, uh, and they, you know, they do it ongoing, but so they had data from December of 2019, they compared it to December of 2020 on hardships, right? Like, I can't pay my rent, I can't pay my mortgage, I'm food insecure, I'm skipping healthcare because of costs, and you know, they count all of these things up. And in 2020, those were all down hmm. on the aggregate relative to 2019. Now, distribution matters, right? Right. So if you look at the people who all lost jobs, they were much more likely than ever other people to report hardships. You know, so you know, we have this very unequal impacts in the economy in terms of just in aggregate what's happened to people. And, you know, I don't know what the right number is in terms of how many are, are still uh, adversely affected. But again, it's it's easy to hide in a country with 120 million households or whatever we have, right? Uh, so even 10 million, you know, that's less than 10%. Right. Um, so, you know, it, it's easy to overlook, you know, and then to the extent that the crisis will come, the big headline crisis will come, and I'll get to unemployment insurance after this point, but the big crisis will come is because we're flipping a switch, right? Normally all these people would have been evicted and foreclosed yep, on the process. At, at a flow. Yep. And what we're going to do is in an incredibly hot housing market where those houses they're actually part of the story mm-hmm. for why we yeah. have high prices is because that supply hasn't been trickling onto the market in the normal rates. And so, but we're going to do it all in, I think it's the end of this month, right? That we've kind of flipped the switch. We're going to flip the switch and we might see a big wave of evictions and foreclosures. And, you know, instead of having it just be the normal dribs and drabs that goes on in the background, uh, unless you're in this world, you kind of ignore it. We'll see a big thing and that'll be a big, lightning rod and it'll be the next or one of the next waves you know, i actually saw an article even today 
about it. Um, so, you know, that'll happen. Um, and, you know, with, we're going to have to support those families in some way. Now, on the unemployment insurance side, so here, what's going on here in Montana. So, obviously, pre-pandemic, uh, there's an enormous literature that finds that when you extend unemployment insurance and pay higher benefits, people do moderately reduce search effort. That was established before. And interestingly, through the pandemic, we, we took hey, we gave you six hundred dollars, then we took that away, and then we gave you three, you know, we've kind of up and down. And it actually didn't show any effect during the pandemic. Okay. Right. So the during the pandemic has been different, but as we're moving out, it's reasonable to think that we're moving back into the pre-pandemic sure. world and not the during the pandemic world. Now there's lots of other stuff happening in the labor market that is affecting the supply. The demand is insane, right? All that money. Right, that more income, the the twelve hundred dollar checks, the higher income, the fact that wages went up, you know. So households have a lot more money in their bank accounts. In fact, Chase put out a report yesterday, um, you know, showing the spikes in uh, account balances at Chase, and you know, people have more money in their bank accounts and they want to go spend it. So employers are trying to hire like crazy. Uh, job postings in Montana are up forty percent relative wow. to pre-pandemic levels. Yep. That's roughly 10,000 jobs above. Normally, this is the season where Montana firms are hiring like crazy anyway. Mm -hmm. And so we're you know well above that. And again, here in Montana, at least, as of March, we still don't have the April data yet. As of March, we were already almost back to pre-pandemic employment. Wow. Right? So you know there wasn't a ton. Our unemployment rate was at pre-pandemic levels. Labor force participation was down a little bit. But there are still more people on unemployment because there's a lot more people who qualify for unemployment than would under normal circumstances. Um, so, you know, there's a little bit of evidence for all sides. There's probably, you know, when they end the, the, the pandemic, you know, all the programs, it's not just the $300, it's all the extra stuff that goes away. You know, there'll be a slight bump probably in labor supply, but it probably won't end the stories about uh, there's no workers just because there aren't any workers right. <laughs> um, and there's no houses to put them in, as we talked about last month. Mm -hmm. That okay. all makes sense. A New Angle is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and UM's College of Business. Access to capital, broadband, and education are three ingredients any community needs for success. I'm Maureen Dowd of the New York Times, and you're listening to A New Angle. Can I jump in on please? Because uh, I, one thing, I, I, Bryce, I liked what you said, but uh, one one thing to note is that evictions are in fact going on, right? So we have an eviction moratorium, but people are still being evicted. First okay. of all, the moratorium itself has a series of exceptions, so it only it only applies to people who have filed a declaration that indicates that their inability to pay rent was related to COVID, mm -hmm. but. If you're conducting criminal activity, you're damaging the property, other concerns, those evictions are still going forward. And in fact, we see some evidence where courts are allowing er, evictions going forward, even in f the non-payment of rent due to COVID circumstances. So, so there are still evictions happening. But the government aid, and for me, the big things is the forbearances and the forgivenesses that, you know, the accommodations is the term we use that have been worked into statute. Part of the reason I think that we see this money flow is that people have been given a break, right? You don't have to pay your mortgage if you can't pay it and work your other bills out because you can get a forbearance in many circumstances, right? Lots of creditors are working with um, their consumers and allowing them to make forbearance payments on all sorts of debt. And that is, all of that is going to end at sort of different times. So like the, the CDC uh, eviction moratorium is set to end June 30th. But a lot of the estimates are unclear, but a lot of the, uh, a lot of the research suggests that we're going to look at the forbearances on at least federally backed mortgages ending um, in September, October, where all of a sudden those will be done. Now, the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, right, has actually, so I, in a paper I wrote, I heavily criticized the Indeed. Bureau yeah. for the way it handled the pandemic under Director Craninger, who was uh, President Trump's appointee to lead the Bureau, 
since uh, President Biden named Dave Wejo as acting director, the Bureau has basically done a 180 degree shift and they actually are trying to get ahead of this. So they issued an interim rule requiring that landlords tell borrowers who might be protected by the CDC eviction moratorium about it. Hmm. So that they, because there was an idea that there was this information asymmetry where con, con, you know tenants didn't really understand. Similarly, and I thought in a, in an excellent proactive move, the CFPB just recently issued a warning to mortgage servicers and said everyone can see what's about to happen. We expect you to ramp up resources so that you can handle this because stories were rampant in 2008 of like the fax machine that just spit documents onto the floor in the corner because the mortgaging servicing departments at banks were just overwhelmed. They had no idea what was coming. And all of a sudden, everybody needed uh, what we call a, a loss mitigation modification, right? They needed some help to, to keep their mortgage. And now we, it's great that the government has actually stepped in and said, look, you know, we see that this is coming to an end. And we don't expect this to go on forever, but we want you to be prepared for it. And we're going to hold you accountable if you're not, which is a great message. When we talk about consumer protection, part of the game is telling people because, you know, there is this cost to doing regulations, right? So you do have to do that. But one of the benefits is, is that for companies that are trying to follow the law, they're actually at a competitive disadvantage by comp from companies that take shortcuts and maybe engage in more predatory behaviors. And if you have a well-functioning regulatory agency enforcing the law, you know, you would expect what's gonna happen is they're gonna see who's following the law and who's not, and focus their efforts there, thereby eliminating sort of a competitive pressure on people. And this is one of the ways in sort of setting those standards in advance, we know going in, this is gonna be a rough patch. You know, you need to, Get out increase in front your of it. training, yeah. hire more people, you know, to go into it. But it's going to be a really a, a tough time for a lot of people because, as I think Bryce said, lots of people in very different circumstances. So let's draw that out a little bit more, Craig. I mean, you referenced your paper asking if the CFPB was still on the beat, so to speak. And, you know, Correct me if I'm wrong, but what I heard in there was that, you know, under the previous uh, leadership, the previous director, they just weren't enforcing the laws. And now the director is enforcing the laws. So that, has the law changed or has just the, the decision by the executive branch to execute the law or not changed? So both, okay. actually. It, a lot of what I show in the paper was that during the pandemic, I make the argument that what we need as for a host of reasons, including the idea of just messaging what conduct's illegal, that we are going to watch for unlawful conduct and take it so that companies don't feel like, oh, I'm going to get taken advantage of because my competitor is going to cut corners. And also so consumers themselves have this understanding that they can act in a marketplace without worrying about predatory behavior. So that under Director Craninger, Basically, the CFPB didn't do anything from an enforcement perspective to address any of these concerns mm -hmm. about COVID. Most of the other agencies, the Federal Trade Commission, the, the Federal Department of Justice, state attorneys general, they were all taking, as, uh, taking action, issuing messages um, about various kinds of unlawful conduct that was particularly aimed at the pandemic and its effects. Price gouging, hoarding, you know, illegal hoarding of like personal protective equipment. Uh, Attorney General Ellison from Minnesota actually brought a series of actions against people who were illegally evicting people. Now, these were small cases, but I'd argue that they're actually very important because they send that message that we are actually monitoring this. Somebody's on the beat. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So we didn't have that from the CFPB. And in fact, what we got was a message of more like, not only are we not on the beat, Companies, we recognize that you're under stress from COVID, which is fair, but we're going to say, even if you can't make these deadlines, we're not going to prosecute those. And rather than viewing it, which after the administration change, the CFPB rolled that back and said, nope, what matters is, are you acting appropriately? And that means 
considering your resources, considering your business, are you taking steps to ensure that consumers are protected? That doesn't mean there won't be mistakes or issues, but it's just a different mindset. And then, so that change has happened. We still haven't seen any enforcement actions, which I think is problematic, but we have seen messages like the one I just mentioned about mortgage servicers, get ready, we're going to be watching for to make sure you've done this. And we've also seen some rulemaking. So they issued a rule to try and help uh, consumer, make sure that consumers knew about the CDC moratorium. You know, that whole issue is being lit. The CFPB has been sued about that, as has HHS, uh, Health and Human Services and that Housing and Urban Development Department. They've all, there are many, many lawsuits across the country about that moratorium. But it's still in effect most places in the country. And a lot of people don't know that. And so the CFPB said, we're going to issue a rule requiring this. They based it on data. So they've done both, mm -hmm. which I think is the right approach, right? Because no single tool in a regulator's toolbox is always the right thing to use. You can enforce, you can supervise, which means sort of working with the entities in a non-public way to resolve problems. And, you know, you can issue rules and regulations. But those take time, even when they're done quickly, as they Indeed. did with the rule about the CDC moratorium. And so going forward, are you optimistic? I mean, you mentioned that we have not, that it's problematic, we have not seen any enforcement uh, actions. Um, do you expect enforcement actions? Like what, what sort of enforcement actions would you want to see happen? So I do. I think we're, what now what we are getting is public messaging that in fact, they are looking for unlawful conducts that, that's particularly targeted to the harms from the pandemic, eviction problems, um, debt collection, and so forth. And I think that that's a good sign. I think they've also indicated that they're going to be on the lookout for credit discrimination mm -hmm. coming out, which is very important, especially since um, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act covers credit discrimination on a variety of fronts, including the receipt of public assistance. Okay. And that's something that people often don't know, but you're not allowed to discriminate against someone in offering credit because they've received public assistance, something that many, many people have received now. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I, you obviously want to see what the data shows, but I do think it's important to get concrete messages out there so that people understand, because if you wait two, three years, all uh, uh, untold amount of harm just happens because nobody understands exactly what the law is maybe, or how it's gonna be enforced. And if it's all happening behind the scenes, the consumers don't know, the companies don't know. They might think, you know, they might see another company violating the law. And they're like, well, are they getting an edge on it? I don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. So that's why these public messages signaling is so important, I think, in ensuring that there's a fair marketplace for everybody. Bryce, you have questions for Craig? I do. Um, so looking backwards, what would be different today or in the past, you know, year or whatever it had been had the CFPB done what you wanted what would how would the world be different so hard to know right uh, given that we're just guessing but there were for what is just one example um, there well first of all let's take the eviction issue right so we've had a series of cases where people were being evicted despite being covered by the moratorium right. and meeting its qualifications, right? And just here in Montana, the, Mo the Montana Legal Services had a case recently where they got the district court to, in fact, correct um, an error at the Justice of the Peace Court where the, per the tenant wasn't allowed to assert that defense. And the district court said, nope, the moratorium applies. That was a great result. Um, Montana Legal Services also has a, with funding from the Department of Commerce, is actually running an eviction defense project to help people because you do have to meet certain steps and only certain people qualify. So that's one example. If we'd had some of those actions early on, we might not have seen, we don't know how many of these evictions could have been stopped because there have been evictions all along. As another example, 
one of the deadline, one of the, I should say, uh, things that the CFPB said we're not going to prosecute you for was failing to investigate disputes about credit reports, right? So a c- consumer says, you know, there's something wrong about my credit report. I want you to fix it or investigate it. And there's statutory deadlines for how long uh, both the credit reporting agencies and the actual furnisher, the, the company that provides the information have, depending on who the complaint is directed to, right? So they said, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna, if you miss those deadlines. But meanwhile, th- they're getting thousands of complaints about missed deadlines. Mm. And you don't know, it's very hard to look back and say, okay, person A, did you miss out on a car loan or a mortgage, you know, a refi opportunity, or did you pay a higher rate than you would have because your credit report was wrong when you did this and you couldn't get it corrected in time? Or did you lose a job opportunity because somebody pulled your credit report and looked at it and saw some wrong information on there? And the CPB actually has a complaint uh, function. So consumers, and I've done this myself uh, when I've been upset with how I've been treated, I've filed a complaint with the CFPB. Anyone can do it. Just go online. You tell them a little bit about it. And they forward it to the company, and then the company responds, and it all, and these are public, so you can go look at it. They're redacted, so they, they hide you know confidential information like the person's name and address and so forth. But there's lots of information on this database that anybody can go look at and just see, and that's how I knew, for example, there'd been thousands of complaints. I just looked and saw how many complaints had been filed over the past year about disputes on uh, credit reports. Mm-hmm. And that turned out to be thousands. So is there any recourse? Is there so any with recourse? Like in, the, in the eviction case, you were like, well, look, you know, I went to legal aid, I got to the district judge, and they said, no, you're not evicted. So, so if, I, if I miss out on my car loan, my refi, can I, you know, is there, a, is there an enterprising class action attorney out there that's going to go and then hire me to do damages <laughs> on it and like, you know, or whatever? So uh, I am sure uh, that, and, I, and we could have a whole other podcast about class actions indeed. and the enforcement of uh, public law through private actions. But, um, you know, it depends is the short answer, right? The Fair Credit Reporting Act actually does allow lawsuits, so you could bring a suit. The fact of the matter is most people don't have the time or the knowledge, and it's just not worth enough. Now, maybe you can find a class action attorney to combine things, but you have it's very difficult when you have to show individualized damages. That's one of the problems yeah. with class actions is, this is, you know, if I have a credit report that's wrong, but I'm the only one who knows it, right? you know, I still want that fixed, but how am I gonna quantify that harm, if at all? Mm-hmm flip that around, you know, you have somebody, okay, well, how do I prove that I could have gotten a higher interest rate? That actually just requires a lot of work and know-how that most people just don't have. So that's why it's so important that we have the Fair Credit Reporting Act and have this structure that requires companies to fix these problems. Because the reality is, if they don't, it's very hard for people to get them fixed in the real world. So maybe let's bring this back, you know, as, as we kind of wrap up here, Craig, to the level of the individual listener, consumer, like how do I know my rights? How do I know, you know, what I should be protected from and not, like, how do I know that? Well, the answer for most people is that they don't. Yeah. You know, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has an entire arm devoted to education and they do a lot of great work on producing what I think are relatively readable, easy to use um, pamphlets, information, blog posts, presentations about your rights. But the fact of the matter is there are so many different laws with so many different requirements. It's very hard for an individual to know exactly what's legal and what's not legal. Mm-hmm. And this is something that it's, that just the, the we as academics and practitioners, the law, we have to wrestle with is like, how do we give effect to these rights that we as a society have decided are important enough to codify in statutes in a world where we only have limited resources in every regulator's office, every regulator faces, even the most active faces serious resource constraints. 
And many people don't understand. This is where class actions can be an effective part of implementing public law, right? Because we it brings more resources to the table. Um, I think there can, you know, there are lots of great organizations, Consumer Reports, um, Consumer Federation of America, National Consumer Law Center, all of whom produce reports. Um, Pew does a number, you know, Brookings has looked at these issues. But how accessible those are to the average person really depends, you know, something like Consumer Reports is much more accessible than something even coming out of Pew, for example. Yeah, so I suppose just that meta point of if you just know that there's somebody on the beat, that there's right. somebody looking out for me. You might not know the exact nature um, of that looking out, but knowing that there's somebody watching um, maybe creates some sense that somebody's on your side as a consumer. A and on the flip side, that you know it's a bit of a watchdog messaging for mm -hmm. the. You know, for the potential predatory uh, businesses out there, and and when those agencies when they take public action, it's not like I you know consumers are not following sure. what these agencies do, but there are many stakeholders that are following them who make it their job to deliver those messages to consumers to try and get the word out. You know, ARP does a lot of great consumer work because elderly persons are often victims of all sorts of predatory behavior and other groups like that. So. That's part of where, you know, the agencies can do their part by getting these public signals out there. Those can then be amplified by other players who do have expertise but have stronger connections to communities right. to try and deliver those messages so that people learn about their rights. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the, you know, it requires a whole series of people. It's not, it's great that the CFPB has an education arm and they do great work, but it it's so much more effective that there are all these other groups out there that are also that and they look to the regulator they see what's happening they have the expertise to understand it and then to translate that into a message that is understandable for the average consumer super well craig this has been an education certainly for me and uh hopefully you bryce uh, to some degree but yeah, Craig, what, what's next on the horizon for you? What's the next project? Are you going to continue with this line of research, continue to watch the Biden administration? What's, what's next for you? Absolutely. I'm going to keep on the back burner. Just I, I always sort of keep my eye on what the various administrations are doing and trying to see trends in enforcement. I'm actually looking a lot at trying to really come up with a, an overarching theory about why we have consumer mm. laws at all. Like, why do we do this? Because occasionally I'll just get questions and they'll be like, well, you know, why should we give that money back to consumers? And I'm like, what do you mean? Why? I mean, it was stolen from them. It's literally like it's an unlawful fee taken right out of their pockets. Like, but you know, people will say, why give that back? Why not use that for some other public good? And that caused me to realize it's like, oh, you know, I have my own uh, universe of ideas in my head, but you know, it's very difficult to get that out to people in general. Right. And so I'm, I'm thinking about trying to do that and, you know, doing I, I really appreciate you having me on because part of that is doing outreach like this in non legal, you know, academics can all talk to each other all day long. And really, I mean, I wrote an article. Uh, academics will hopefully read it at some point. Sure. But dozens. Getting, You'll have dozens of readers. Exactly. <laughs> but getting it into the hands of or getting the basics from it into reporters hands. Um, I'm going to be developing uh, the Blewett program is going to be developing, you know, a consumer law page that is going to try and connect up with some of the academics, but also produce um, some information for average people uh, to tr that a place where they could look if they were interested in these issues to try and get a handle on, you know, what are my rights or what kind of behavior should I be looking out for? Because ultimately, it's that question we started with. Um, Bryce mentioned it was like, I think that consumers, we, we, we should want to live in a society where consumers can go into the marketplace and not have to assume that everyone's lying to them yeah. and have real choices, right? You need both. You need the information and you also, there also has to be something you can do with the information. That click through problem, I mean, I, I, I won't 
it's frightening how many consumer lawyers themselves don't read the contracts that they sign. <laughs> you know, every sure. year I go to a conference where somebody tracks this and it's always a frightening number of people admit that they're like, yeah, I don't, you know, who has, who can do that? And part of that's because what choice do you have, you know, as far as this goes? And really thinking conceptually about what does it mean for people to be able to actually make the best decisions possible for their families in the marketplace where there is if we don't do anything, serious information and power asymmetry. Like, how do we level those out? Sure. Well, Craig, Bryce, thanks so much for coming in today. And thanks best of luck me. with the outreach campaign. And uh, congratulations on being a newly minted associate professor. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49 generous gift of UM alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. A New Angle is presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business, with additional support from Consolidated Electrical Distributors and Drum Coffee. AJ Williams is our producer. VTO Jeff Amet and John Wicks made our music. And Jeff Meese is our master of all things sound. If you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at a new angle at umontana.edu. If you liked what you heard, tell your friends about it. Thanks a lot. See you next time. <laughs>